Uh, good morning. I miss you all. I'm, I'm looking at two cameras and there's some lights and I miss seeing all your faces. It's good to be with you this morning. I'm dressed. You're in your pajamas. I'm jealous, seriously. So I want to give you some hope today. I want to give you some encouragement. I was pondering the thought, how should we live in fear-filled times like these, you know, in times of crisis and uncertainty? How, how are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to navigate this? You know, when you look at all the news articles, and I would encourage you, don't spend a whole lot of time on the news right now. Uh, but when you look, you see these key words that pop up. Death, worry, fear, anxiety, blame, confusion, panic, worst case scenarios, catastrophic, pandemic, misinformation. I mean, just think about all those things that dominate the articles and the newscasts. And those have the potential to dominate our thinking. So, you know, when I think about this, my head's not in the sand. I'm not, you know, I don't have this escapist mentality and mindset. You know, I'm a realist. I'm a biblical realist. I take Jesus' words very seriously. When he said, in this world, you will have trials, you will have tests, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So I'm rooted in that. I'm grounded in that. That's where my thought is. But I want to also share that if there's any comfort in this when you think about it, you know, there's nobody that is experiencing this apart from anybody else. This is a universal, it's a global situation. It's something that really the whole planet, every country is going through together. So nobody could say, I wish I was over in that place over there. Or I wish I was over there. I mean, the reality is this is, real, this is you know, happening simultaneously to all of us. So we're all in the same boat. This is all a common experience, a shared experience. Yeah. And I, be, I believe God's going to get the glory in all this. I believe we're going to get through this. I believe this too shall pass. Yeah. What, what makes this a little potentially difficult is when you think about it, I've asked, I'm going to say about a dozen to 20 people in the last week, um, just, do you know anybody that's tested positive? And out of the 19 or 20 people that I've just asked, uh, almost all of them have had said no. Um, I personally, I know two, a husband and a wife, and you know, one guy is fighting for his life. Another one has passed away. Um, I was an acquaintance. I didn't know him. He was a friend, uh, a relative of a friend of mine. And so, you know, as you think about that, it's, you know, it's still out there. There's this sense that it's, it's disconnected. It's way out there. But as time goes on, and not to, not to be a fatalist here or anything, but as time goes on, we'll start hearing more and we'll recognize names and we'll, ha we'll know people. And then it will go from being out there to really up close and personal. So how shall we live? How shall we think in times like this? You know, I was spending time in the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus, Magna Carta of discipleship. Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7. And there's a couple of thoughts in eight verses that I want to encourage you with and just, you know, glean some understanding. But in Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, you can turn with me now. But here's, here's what Jesus said. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. Don't worry about your life. What you'll eat, what you'll drink, about your body, what you'll put on is life. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? He says this word, do not worry, literally means don't give way to anxiety and unease. It means don't dwell on problems and difficulties. They're there, but what Jesus is saying is don't worry about them. Don't obsess over them. He's direct, he's insistent, and he's emphatic on this. Do not worry. You know, when you, when you read the end and the conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount, when you get to the end of chapter 7, it's really interesting that with the people that are listening, nobody says, yeah, but. Nobody says, well, you don't really understand where I came from. You don't understand my family dynamics. You don't understand my dysfunction. Or you don't understand the pro poverty that I'm in or the situation I'm in. You know, it's interesting. Nobody responds like that. Nobody responds with excuses or yeah, buts. They respond with, they were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one that had authority. The words of Jesus had the power and authority that transcended every situation, circumstances that people were going through. He said, don't worry about it. Don't give way to that. One psychiatrist wrote about something called anxiety addiction, which I thought was fascinating. She said, I've seen that many people are addicted to the adrenaline rush of anxiety, known as the fight or flight response, and don't know how to diffuse it. 
An example of this is obsessively watching the news about natural disasters, trauma, and economic stress, and violence, and then not being able to turn off the bad news. So if you can't shut it off, you become fixated, you get a false rush out of the deal. Once again, I want to draw your attention back to Matthew chapter 6. Six times in nine verses, Jesus addresses this emotion called worry. And he says, don't. Now, I'm not saying pretend something that's not there that is there. I'm saying be aware. Absolutely. Be, we're aware. We're concerned, for sure. We're informed. But don't be worried. Now, it's interesting, you know, a month ago, I was on a plane going to Pakistan, and we were crossing somewhere over there. Uh, I think we were over the North Pole, and I finally got to go to sleep in the middle of the night. And I don't normally sleep on planes, but I, 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 I had to drift off, and I started sleeping. And then all of a sudden, I was awakened by alarms and blinking red lights that were going off. And I knew that wasn't normal. And so I'm thinking, you know, what's going on? I'm aware of the situation. I'm around, aware of the surroundings. And then when you see flight attendants running up and down the aisles, you know, okay, that's concerning. Uh, that has some potential for something not good. And so in the midst of all this pandemonium, I'm sitting in the first row of the bulkhead, and I'm looking across the plane, and I see an orange glow coming out of the bathroom. Now, I know that's not good. I know that's not helpful. And, and the frantic uh, flight attendants... You know, just running back with a lady across the aisle, grabs my arm. I'm fearful. What's going on? I'm scared. And I said, do you want to pray? And she said, no, which blew my mind. She says, no, she's scared. She's afraid. She's worried, but she didn't want to pray. So as all as I'm saying is there was a peace. I'm going to tell you that in the midst of that, there was a peace and there wasn't a fear. Now, I don't know how that escalated what would have happened, but I did what I knew to do in that moment. And what I did do was I prayed with the person next to me. I grabbed a big water bottle and I headed for the, for the fire. That's all you can do. Fortunately, they had an extinguisher and they got it out, but that could have been a not good situation. Don't worry. Let the peace of God, and it's a choice. It's a discipline. Let the peace of God rule and reign in your hearts. Here's two thoughts. I've said it for years. I get two good thoughts per week. And I'm going to give you both thoughts on Sunday. So I'm good for the rest of the week. Here's my two thoughts on worry out of Matthew chapter 6. We don't have to worry because we have an open invitation to depend on God. You know, the big key to this not worrying, the big key, I believe, to overcoming anxiety is in verse 9. That's the big key. If you go back to verse 9, here's what Jesus said. He's teaching everybody how to pray. And he says this, when you pray, say, our Father who is in heaven. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Of all the things Jesus could have taught about prayer, the first thing that he teaches them is to view God as their Father. He's drawing them away from religion and rules and regulation, and he's drawing them to the paternal nature of God himself. The generosity of God, the compassion of God. The awesomeness of God. First line in the most significant prayer in history is our Father. Prayer is a way to abide and it's a weapon to crush worry. Verse 26, Jesus said, look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And hope you, hopefully you believe that. Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Or literally 18 inches. So why do you worry about clothing? He's just talking about daily worries. We, he hasn't even got to the crisis part yet. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, and they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles, or people that don't know God, they seek these things. They're preoccupied with these things. For your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Now, isn't it interesting? I've read, the, I've read these scriptures many, many times. And to be quite frank, 
when I see birds and when I see lilies and I see grass, I, I want to get to the good part. I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about birds and flowers and grass, you know. But there's something really interesting here. What Jesus is saying is that in the midst of this worry situation, look up and look around. Yeah. Isn't it interesting? He doesn't say, look at people. Mm. He says, look at creation. Come on, look at nature. And then, isn't it interesting? He, he starts out, he says, look low at the grass, then look a little higher, look at the lilies, still look higher, look at the birds of the air. He wants us to change our perspective. He wants us to change what we focus on, what we look at, and how we view things. Yeah, that's good. Everywhere you look, if you will look, you will see the care and generosity of God. That's the first thought. We have an open invitation to depend on God. He wants us. And number two, here's the second thought. We don't have to worry because Jesus tells us the alternative to worry. This is powerful. What's the alternative to worry? See, it's not just a, about, okay, I'm going to stop worrying. And in my own strength, I'm going to stop worrying. There's got to be an alternative. So Jesus said, look other places. And then he says this, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God. What a great alternative. What a great redirect. I want to encourage you to, to just let go of the preoccupation with what tomorrow might bring, where this might go. I want you to let go of fear, and I want you to think about redirecting priorities and focus and energy to seek as a matter of priority and first importance. The kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The rule and reign over which God expresses his sovereignty. It's the kingdom. And he says, seek first and seek his righteousness, which would be the order and the alignment of heaven. Seek first that. And all these things are going to be added to you. And therefore, here he goes again. Do not worry about tomorrow. Stay in this present moment. Stay with, stay with Jesus in this present moment. Right here, right now, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You know, one thing that I've heard that sounds normal, sounds right, but I really want to challenge this thought. And that's the thing that people say, I can't wait for things to get back to normal. Wow. Let me say, I believe that in the realm of the kingdom of God, he's the one that has the sole right to redefine what's normal for his children. Yeah. And I think if you're, I think you, if you and I are saying, I just want things to get back to normal, we assume an old normal was better than the new thing that God wants to do wow. in this next season. Wow. Come on. I don't, I don't want to get back to normal. I want to get to the new thing today that God has for me today, well, yeah. and the new and next thing that God has for me tomorrow. Because I know God is still a creator. God is still, behold, making all things new. Let him do the new thing. Don't long for the old thing. Yep. There is a new thing. You see, here's the deal. When you and I focus on the kingdom, when we give up worry, ugh, I'm going to hurt you now. You got to surrender control. Yeah. Any control freaks out there? Yes. Yeah. There are. You're watching right now. There's a little bit of that in me. And depending on the day, there can be a lot of that in me. Let's think about this for a minute. Think about all the things you can't control right now. You can't control the government response. You can't control your job. You can't control the number of respirators. You can't control the outcome of this, the duration, how long this is left. You have no control of this. You have no control over your future. And that's not a bad thing because as we relinquish control, I either have to manage things in self-sufficiency or I have to trust the God that loves me created me, knows my past, knows my present, and ultimately knows my future. Yes, yeah. I can't control that. What can I control? Here's what I would encourage you. I can control my response. I can control every single day how I respond to what's going on around me. I can control the input, what I let into my mind and my thinking. I can control what I get done. Wow, I never knew Honeydew lists were like a real thing. <laughs> Every day, man, there's a new chart. My wife's got a little chart, little boxes that I'm supposed to X out because she's an essential worker. She works every day and I'm stuck at home with my to-do list. I have control over that. 
She gives me little stars. It's awesome. I can control my choices. I can control whether I reach out or withdraw. Yeah. Yeah. If I connect with people or if I live in isolation and withdraw. I can control a reset for my life. And I want to encourage you. This is a word. There's two words, two, two things that have been just kind of going over and over. This is a great time to reset your life with God. And secondly, it's a great season to let him redefine your life as you know it. So give up the control that you think, which is illusionary. You don't have control. And control what you can. You can control how you live. You can control your values. So I want to pray for you, church. I want to pray for everybody watching, everybody that's going to watch here. Um, Don't be discouraged. Be encouraged, man. This is a great season because Jesus is present tense with us right now. So let's pray. Grab a hand of a family member and we're going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you by the power of the Holy Spirit to reset our lives, lives, reorder our lives, and redefine our lives. I pray for any person out there that is habitually worrying, obsessing, hyper-focusing, catastrophic thinking. I pray the peace of God that passes all understanding would come to them in a profound way and they would let your peace rule and reign in their life through jesus name amen